powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, this is Football at Four. Yes, Football at Four, the day before the second Eagles preseason game. We're talking about it right now here on the Sports Bash. Josh Hennig filling in for Mike Gill here on 97.3 ESPN FM, the 97.3 ESPN mobile app. And as always, we are live on YouTube and Twitter. We're joining us right now to talk more about the Eagles as they are about uh, 26 hours from the next preseason game is the one and only Jeff Mosher here on 97.3 ESPN. Joining us each and every Wednesday here on the Sports Bash. Jeff, how are you doing today? I'm great, Josh. How are you? I'm doing well. Well, I'm at least certainly doing better than Tyree Jackson because, yeah. um, you know, it's to me, this is the a, a very interesting story because what the Eagles do with him could have some very interesting consequences on the 53 man roster. Because as you and Adam talk about on the inside the birds pod, Jeff, the initial roster may be one thing, but, you know, there's a lot of ramifications with half with um, Tyree Jackson because do they put him on the roster and then put him on the injury list with the dedication to return? Do they just put him out for the entire year? You know, what do they do with him? Whatever happens to him could impact somebody else making or not making the roster. Yeah. So they could roll the dice, right. And wave him with an injured designation at the, at the final cutdowns and see if another team winds up claiming him even while hurt. And of course that would mean that they would lose him if they don't, if no team claims the backup developmental tight end who's injured, um, they would have an opportunity to then bring him back and, um, you know, when he's when he's healthy, right? Um, and then do it, you know, at that point, they can probably sign him to the practice squad, which is where, you know, I, I think that they would like to probably develop him anyway. The second thing they can do, Josh, and this is probably the more likely scenario, just out of speculation here, is that you keep him on your 53. You don't cut him, even though he's injured at the moment. And you do wind up cutting a player that you think you can bring back quite easily who's not going to get claimed off waivers. You know, they've got a couple of veterans like a Richard Rodgers, um, a, a Hassan Ridgeway, T.Y. McGill, who they probably are going to want to keep for depth purposes but aren't afraid, per se, to lose uh, through the waiver wire. So um, you can cut the, one of those guys to keep space for Tyree Jackson. And then as soon as, you know, um, the, you, you get to the next day and your roster has to be set, you can then put Tyree Jackson on the, the IR, which now there's different rules. You can bring guys back, whatever you can put either way, you can put them on IR, which opens up the space. And then you can bring back one of those guys you cut provided that they aren't claimed. And I think that there, there's some high confidence that some of the guys I mentioned can be cut without being claimed. The other question is, you know, how does the Zach Ertz situation impact all this, right? The idea that, you know, is Zach Ertz going to be here? Is he not going to be here? Or could he be traded at the trade deadline? The uncertainty with Ertz probably impacts what the Eagles do with tight end as well, correct? Oh, I would think so. I mean, uh, you know, if, if Zach Ertz is here, then you've got Ertz, you have Goddard taking up two of your spots. You're probably only going to keep at most four. And then you've got Richard Rodgers and Jack Stoll, and then there would be no room for Tyree Jackson on the 53. If Ertz is not here, that opens up room to have Tyree Jackson on the 53. Even, even so, though, you know, the 53, Josh, sometimes you carry guys on your 53, those last two or three spots, it's like extra practice squad. They're usually inactive on game day and you're just trying to keep them in your house and develop them. I don't think Tyree Jackson, um, as, as nice as of a story as he's been, is someone that the Eagles felt even when healthy was going to have an impact on their game day uh, roster uh, in, in September or maybe even early October. You know, he's a guy who obviously need, has, has exceeded expectations, but still needs a lot of development. Now, after everything you just said, I'm also curious about what this means for the preseason because now that Jackson's not out there in the preseason, who is the garbage time tight end now? Is it is it Jack Stoll and who else? Yeah, it's interesting, right? Because they just recently uh, waived um, Caleb uh, Wilson. Caleb Wilson, but they still have Jason Kroom. I, I I know he had been hurt. I can't even remember if he's 
back at this point. They still have, um, you know, they had moved Hakeem uh, uh, Butler to back to wide receiver, but they certainly could move him to tight end or play him in a in a hybrid like position. They could play more four and five wide receiver sets if they wanted to. I, I but I do think you'll you'll get a decent amount of run tomorrow night from Jack Stoll and from Richard Rogers and from Kroom if he's available to play and and um, some other you know the, the bottom guys. Football for Jeff Mosher, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast, joining us here on a Wednesday edition on 97.3 ESPN at Jeff Mosher NFL on Twitter. Jeff, the news that came out yesterday that was interesting, the cuts that came down, uh, the waving of on Johnson. I haven't talked to you since that happened. And to me, that pretty much signifies that you got four running backs making this team. I think it pretty much sets in stone who the running backs are going to be. And it makes a lot of sense because you and Adam have talked about it on the Inside the Birds pod that, listen, Sirianni and Stike can come from very specific offensive backgrounds, and they like having certain running backs on their depth chart, and it feels like all four of these running backs, Sanders, Howard, Scott, and Gainwell, all kind of fit the mold of what we've seen from running backs with the Colts and with the Chargers in the past. Yeah, definitely. And I think Carrion could have fit the mold. He was not exactly in the, you know, he did, I don't think he reported in the greatest shape of his life and he really needed to stay healthy because being injured uh, has been a big reason for why he has not been able to, you know, did, had no staying power with the Lions. And of course he had the knee injury again. And it had become clear that not only had Carrion not really done anything, but that Jordan Howard, going back to OTAs, Josh, came in with a renewed sense of, of self and uh, obviously in great shape. He admitted that he was not in good shape last year when he signed with the Dolphins. He had had the stinger the year before with the Eagles at the end of the year. Didn't work out the right way. And um, was and he came back this year ready to go. The Eagles are kind of the only organization that seems to show the kind of faith in him because he had no other offers. Deuce Staley used to love him, by the way. Deuce Staley was a huge fan of Jordan Howard. And Deuce Staley had a lot of respect in the Eagles organization. So not surprised even with Deuce Staley gone that they went and brought him back to see what he has. I thought he's looked good since OTAs. He came to training camp ready to take the load uh, of, you know, take, take that, take a couple of carries and see what he can do. We saw in the, the Pittsburgh game, his blitz pickup, which has always been his strength was on display again. And he's really the only guy right now after Miles Sanders, if Miles Sanders were to get hurt and you need a guy to be able to tote the ball, you know, 12, 15, 17 times a game, He's built for that. Boston Scott is not, and Kenneth Gainwell is not. He is. So he is a really key, vital part of this running back group with Miles as your starter, Jordan Howard as your backup, and you have some good change of pace, change up backs that are similar but also different in Boston Scott and in Kenny Gainwell. And look, Nick Sirianni said it the other day, it's no secret they're going to throw to their running backs. They're going to have formations, Josh, with multiple running backs on the field at the same time, some of them are going to be lined up in the backfield. Sometimes they'll be lined up in, in spread formations. They're going to throw the ball to the running backs. How much do you think also the running backs is going to impact not just who they are throwing to, but in terms of we know Sirianni is going to run different off as Doug Peterson does. So are we going to potentially see a little more disguising going on, maybe a little bit more you know, modifications of the line of scrimmage. Like, could we see a little bit more variety than we saw with Doug last year who at times was just like, yeah, 12 personnel, good luck. Yeah, and, you know, even last year, Doug kind of got very vertical, 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 vertical. I do know that the Nick Sirianni philosophy, and we'll see if he's able to execute it, is to try to get the ball in the hands of his playmakers in confined spaces quickly. You know, get the ball to guys in space and let them – use their natural athleticism to create yards after the catch. Obviously, also, you need a quarterback who puts the ball in the right spots in one-on-ones to be able to do that. Jalen Hurts did a nice job of that against Pittsburgh. But, you know, you look at a guy like Jalen Rager. That's a guy who I think that they want to move all around. You haven't seen it yet in the preseason because they're still just working him into the right condition and the right um, – and making sure everything – his P's and Q's are, are tight. But at, at some point, maybe soon, because he's starting to really pick it up, you might see him – you know, line up in the backfield or come on a shallow cross where everything else is deep and you put him in space uh, against the zone there and let him be able to catch the ball, turn up field, and turn the Jets on. And you did see some of that with the Quez Watkins tunnel screen there. So I do – I think that that mostly illustrated how 
they want to, they want to emphasize getting the ball in the hands of their fast, dynamic playmakers quickly. Speaking of dynamic, fast playmakers, taking on the offensive side of the ball, you know, I've heard a lot, and I've seen a lot of John Rager, Quez Watkins this week at the joint practices, and the only thing I've seen of Travis Fulgham was Nick Sirianni criticizing him for not dragging his foot in the back of the end zone. Mm. And, Jeff, I asked the question earlier, and I want to ask it to you. Is Travis Fulgham going to make this team? Because he was completely invisible in game one, and... I haven't heard about him at these joint practices. I've heard about Quez Watkins and Rager. Even on Sports Center on television, they're saying, you know, these young receivers of the Eagles are looking really good. Their names are Watkins and Rager. And I'm like, uh, what happened to Fulgham? Is this supposed yeah. to be a coaching staff that's supposed to be the all the wide receiver gurus, right? Are all coming to Philadelphia. You know, he went from the quarterback factory to the wide receiver factory, right? And Fulgham has just kind of like faded to black. So, Jeff, is he even going to make this team? You're asking a very fair question, Josh. And going into camp, I would have told you, just based on lack of depth at that position alone, that it's going to be very difficult for Travis Fulgham to not make the team. I still think at the end of the day, he's going to wind up making it. But I will tell you, the trajectory that he's on now, if he doesn't pick it up, he will be in danger of not making the team. They're probably going to keep five receivers. They're not going to keep six because they don't have six receivers who are merit being kept you're not just going to say i want six receivers because i need six receivers you're going to keep the number of receivers that you think you need to have to play on game day you know including thinking of injuries and depth and special teams and right now it's five and to be honest with you after four you're already getting dicey your your top four and i i can even say even a three and four year old you've got some question marks jalen rager still has to um continue his his uh you know his progression over the last, you've seen over the last week after a rough start but not regardless Devonte smith is in jalen rager is in greg ward it doesn't matter we know what greg ward can do he's reliable he's heady they don't have to coach him hard he may be limited from an explosion standpoint but he's reliable smart can, can contribute a lot of ways so he's three and quez watkins is a is a four now there's a little bit too much love right now going on for quez i think he's had a really good camp and the preseason, I think people got to get a little overboard on trying to say, is he a starter now? I think he's a flash player who you can throw in in certain packages to stretch the field. We'll have more on that in tomorrow's um, Inside the Birds on, on this, you know, him and the wide receiver outlook. But those are your four. So if you're keeping five, you have to choose between Travis Fulgham, who, as you just mentioned, has kind of disappeared, right? You have to choose between him, J.J. Arthago Whiteside, or uh, Osbin, I guess. Am I missing a wide receiver? Oh, yeah, and John Hightower who we've outlined it many times. It's a guy who really struggles to get everything together, uh, be consistent, has to be coached hard, and then he got hurt. So it's not like he was having the greatest camp to begin with. So by virtue of those numbers alone, I think what we're talking about here is Travis Fulgham Fulgham versus J.J. Ortega-Whiteside. Now, I think the last time we talked, Josh, I mentioned to you, Ortega-Whiteside made a tackle on special teams against the Steelers. That's not something he's done in the past, playing on special teams. But he's playing on special teams now, which is a big thing if you're a fourth or fifth ride receiver. And of all the guys I just mentioned, while he might not be the explosive, dynamic guy that they thought he was when they picked him in the second round, he is not as much of a headache. I don't want to call him a headache. He's not as much of a, a challenge for the coaches. Like, he's invested. He's a smart guy, a lot of football intelligence. He tries hard. You know, he's, they're not worried about where he's lining up or whether he knows the playbook. Those are the kind of guys you want to coach and get the most – talent most out of um, because you know you can rely on them so if he can continue along this path do some things on special teams maybe catch a ball every once in a while when he's in there and he is playing in the slot now which I think um, might be a better spot for him anyway then I can see the coaches at the end of the day deciding let's go with him instead of Fulgham but I, I, I don't know that that I'm not locking that down right now it just seems to be the way it's trending at the moment yeah, and listen, I, I know there is a group of Eagle fans who don't want to hear me say this, but you can't be a guy who caught 23 touchdowns in two years at Stanford, Stanford of all places, and be an <laughs> idiot. You know what I mean? Like, y- you got to Stanford and you were a high-level receiver for David Shaw for two years for a reason. I don't think it's an accident. So, listen, if you could carve out a role in playing special teams to being a Maybe, a, maybe part of like a red zone package. They just go big receivers all yep. over the place. There's yep. a role for that. And so I know Eagle fans are like, J. Josh stinks. But you know what? 
he, he can't stink that much because you know what? He's in the NFL right now. You know who isn't? Shelton Gibson. Right. Right. I mean, and, and, you know, look, the book on Travis is he tends to get down on himself. He tends to lose confidence. We saw that last year when Alshon came back. Right. So he's got a. I still think talent level. You, you want him to make the team. Yes. Because he, if he's if his confidence is high, he can go out there and make plays that J.J. Ortega Whiteside cannot make. So it's it's important not to make this judgment right now. It's just, you know, we have a preseason game tomorrow. Um so we'll see. Travis can maybe snap his fingers and turn it up. We've seen that with Jalen. Jalen had a tough first week. Right. Got some hard coaching. And now he's looking like he's the, the, the package right now. So hopefully for Travis Fulgham, he picks it up. Jeff, I want to also ask you about Andre Dillard. Because yesterday, a very under-the-radar transaction happened. I think a lot of Eagle fans or football fans in general maybe completely ignored it. But the Panthers traded Greg Little to the Dolphins. He got a seventh-round pick in 2022. And the mm-hmm. reason why I think it's significant, I mentioned this yesterday, is because Greg Little was the fifth offensive tackle taken in the 2019 draft. The first was Dillard. So if the fifth tackle, who was a second-round pick, gets a seventh-round pick, if the Eagles were to trade Dillard, that tells me right now, Jeff, that I don't know what they're exactly going to get in return for him if anything valuable at all. So if Dillard is not on this team and you decide to move on from him, you might not be able to get anything more than a fourth or fifth round pick for him, honestly. I, I, that's a, it's a very fair point. I have no idea if they even still want to trade him or to want to continue to just ride it out and develop him, even if he doesn't win the job. You know, I mean, he's obviously been hurt throughout camp. He's got a knee injury now. He had the, the hands and the fingers seemingly giving him a problem a, a week or two ago. That's, that's an obviously not, you know, helpful for his image. Uh, but I, I think they want to see it through, at least get him back on the field and healthy and a little bit more productive to, to perhaps increase that trade value because right now I don't know that it's looking very good. i tell you one thing, though, about the Greg Little trade that may, you know, perk our eyebrows a little bit is that, you know, Matt Pryor played well at right tackle against the Steelers, and he's actually had, like, a decent camp. And this guy is the biggest tease in the world because there are – Times where he flashes and looks like he can be a an adequate offensive lineman. And then there are times where, like last year when they had him play left tackle and Josh Sweat just kept driving the truck over him over and over and over, and he looks like he can't even play in the league. But, I, I you know, if you do the numbers now, it's hard to see Matt Pryor making this team, especially if Landon Dickerson at some point is going to come off NFI and take up a roster spot. But he has played well enough in some spurts and has been the first one or two guys off the bench last year to make you wonder if at cutdown you couldn't trade him and get some compensation for it. Because this, as you just mentioned with the, with the little trade, I mean, this is a very offensive line deficient league and teams are looking for anybody who can show that, that they they can just be adequate sometimes at the position just to have depth. Jeff Mosher football and four powered by the inside the birds podcast the next episode drops tomorrow morning with Jeff and Adam. Of course, right now out is the Q&A episode that dropped this morning. Uh, by the way, we should mention that literally every wide receiver that Jason Avant likes from the pod is doing well at camp. So <laughs> yes. I, I, don't, I don't know if that's a coincidence or maybe Avant is just that that good at evaluating receivers. Well, we'll let the audience figure that out. But uh, yeah. definitely you want to listen to Q&A because literally everything Jason has said about these receivers has come to life. And it's... It's amazing and creepy at the same time. So Right, right. Lo- it's amazing because Adam and I have been talking about the issues facing John Hightower for quite a while, going back to why he fell to the fifth round in the draft. And some of the feedback we would get, oh, you guys are being too hard on him. You're, you're, you know, you're stereotyping him or something like that. Then Jason says the says was even harsher than we were. Right, yes. In his, in his uh, assessment of him. And he coached the guy last year. And um, now everybody believes. So good. Now I'm glad we have Jason and Quentin on our platform to do that because I know it does help to hear it from guys who played the game as to as opposed to sometimes hearing it from reporters. Well, also you, like you just said, you and Adam, you present it as a report. You present it as sources tell, and then Jason could just come out there and just go blast mode on people like he did on Nick Mullins. <laughs> yes, he has firsthand experience. Oh yeah, with Nick Mullins, that was uh, <laughs> that was an interesting quote there. <laughs> no, that was definitely a good quote, Jeff. Before I let you go, I do want to go on defense real quick. Um, Jonathan Gannon this week has been uh, very complimentary of Alex Singleton, and you know between what you said to me on Monday. 
earlier this week and what Gannon said this week, I'm starting to feel more and more that Singleton might have a big year this year in this defense because I'm thinking more and more about, you know, the way these defenses are run in Minnesota and Indianapolis. And this might be the first year in a long time that we see legit productivity from the linebackers in an Eagles defense, and it's going to be under Jonathan Gannon. Yeah, you know, Josh, when you play a cover two, which is I think you're going to see a decent amount of that from from Jonathan Gannon. Now, it may not look traditional like cover two. It may look like cover two and then become cover one because you bring one safety down a little bit at the, right before the snap, or it may look like cover one with a safety in the box, and then he drops back a little bit. But the bottom line is when you play any kind of amount of cover two, you do put pressure on the linebackers to stop the run, and they have to be rangy. Um, don't always have to be downhill because your your defensive line play and scheme can kind of try to funnel the run to the outsides, right? But you have to be rangy. You have to be sideline to sideline. And I, well, what, what Eric Wilson and Alex Singleton lack in bulk and being downhill style players, they compensate for being sideline to sideline rangy playmakers. So I think that that is where their strength is. And yes, that there there's going to be a lot of responsibility on their shoulders this year, as far as being key run stoppers, especially when the, the Eagles are showing those cover two looks at Jeff Mosher NFL on Twitter, the inside the birds podcast, subscribe, download the new episode comes out tomorrow morning. Adam and Jeff will get you prepared in the morning for the second Eagles preseason game, which you can hear here on 97.3 ESPN. Jeff, great stuff today. And uh, I guess I should say, can can you enjoy a preseason game tomorrow night? Yes, I like football in general, and I like learning about – I probably actually enjoy it more than most fans, Josh. I mean, a lot of guys, you know, fans turn the game off after the first quarter or second quarter, but I'll be in there third quarter, fourth quarter, wondering – if Marlon Tui Pelotu is going to make a play yes. or, uh, you know, anything like that. So, I, yeah, I definitely dig the uh, the, the second. I, I dig the preseason games. I mean, I get what they are, but, yes, I, I still enjoy them. Well, it's good to know it's not just me and Checo watching the, uh, the second half of the game. So. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew DeCheco will be there for representing Inside the Birds. So uh, he, he's got the, the credential for tomorrow night. So everybody make sure that they're following him and, and looking at InsideTheBirds.com for our, his coverage. Well, also because of the fact that Andrew literally knows every single player's college background on the roster. So there's he probably going to be a guy who makes a play in the third quarter that he's going to tweet about, and it'll only be him tweeting about it. Yeah, he definitely nerds out like that. Even that play that Rager made the other day in practice, the big one-handed catch against, I guess the cornerback's name was Michael Jackson Jr. or something like that, I think. And Andrew had texted me, yeah, I remember speaking to Michael Jackson Jr. at the – at the Senior Bowl a couple a year or two ago, and I'm like, oh my god! <laughs> uh, good stuff. That's All right. Andrew. All right, Jeff. Have a good one, man. Catch you later. You too, man. Take care. Josh Eddick, Philly from Mike Gell here on the Sports Bash on 97.3 ESPN tomorrow. Football at four with Adam Kaplan, and then the aforementioned Andrew Checo on Friday's edition of Football at Four, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast.